What's overthrowing the government, my consortium of shady financial interests? Wes, 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 what's up? What's up? Yeah. I don't know. I got nothing. <laughs> that was awful. Uh, on, this Bob. is behind the insurrections, uh, the behind, behind the bastards mini series about fascist yeah. attempts to seize power, uh, and this is our last episode of this beautiful mini series. We did have a seventh episode planned, but um, I had some. Aww personal news uh that's that's gonna uh alter our work schedule a little bit but we will get to that yeah. episode at some point but not next week um yeah. uh my guest uh, with this one as as with always uh on our mini series uh jason petty aka prop what's up what's up what's up proper g's in the building now prop i'm gonna cut yes. right to the chase have you heard cut. of the business plot no <laughs> oh good <laughs> oh well one of the things that's fun about this is that um uh, one of our characters from behind the police is the main character of of this story um oh, our old word. friend smedley okay. butler yeah uh the guy who ran the police in philadelphia the marine general yes. so okay. that's that's I gonna be him. exciting hmm? yeah i know that guy so if the business plot is it there's a reason why you haven't heard of it. Uh, a lot okay. of people have put in a lot of effort to make sure that people don't talk about this anymore. Um, right. Imagine a cadre of plutocratic bankers, financiers, and media moguls all conspired to take over U.S. democracy and institute a fascist state hidden as a fake democracy. Um, shouldn't take a whole lot of imagination. Wait, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what people say the record industry is yeah the record industry or yeah, the okay. way a lot of our government works right now like the fact yeah. that Janet Yellen uh, had financial ties to one of the giant hedge funds that uh, shut down the game stock trading and stuff like yeah you know yes. it may sound that sounds familiar to people um, yes. but usually we're talking about it most people are talking about it, you know when we talk about like well there's a cadre of elites who control you know the government um, they mean it in sort of a, a deep state sense. But there was yeah. a time where the wealthiest men in America engaged in a very real conspiracy to have a paramilitary army seize the levers of power, overthrow the president, uh -huh. and institute a fascist state. Um, and there's people alive today who lived through it. Uh, it happened in the 30s. So, it's yeah. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, <laughs> this is a story people should know. Um, I think you'll yes. find this one interesting prop. So, our, OK, our, this is good. This is going to be one of those ones where I'm like, I'm actually going in. Like, yeah. Completely <laughs> this is a uh, fun one. Yes. So our our story starts with one of my favorite historical figures, as I told you, Major General Smedley Butler. We're talking about old yeah. Smedley again. Um, Smedley. So we're, we're going to start by talking about him because he's at the center of all this. So Sm okay. Smedley Butler was born in 1881. He was the eldest son of a Quaker family from Westchester, Pennsylvania. His father, Thomas, was a congressman and uh, his maternal uh -huh. grandfather was in Congress as well. So this is a guy who comes from a lot of privilege and power. Um, okay. He attended the Haverford School, which is a secondary school for rich kids from Philadelphia. And he thrived in this upper crust elite institution. Uh, he became captain of the school baseball team and quarterback of the football team. And he seemed to be on the road to a career in politics or business. But then 38 days before his 17th birthday, he left school to enlist in the United States Marine Corps. Um, so he's on okay. like a path to follow, you know, into business or into politics. And then when he's 16, he leaves home to join the Marines. Now, this pisses off his dad, uh, who didn't want his kid joining the Marines. But the reason Smedley had joined is that the Spanish-American War had just started, which we chatted about a bit last week. And Smedley yeah. wanted to fight. Um, so he lied about his age to the Marines and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. He landed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, shortly after it was captured. And he didn't see any action there. Uh, his unit was sent back to the mainland and he could have been cashiered out, you know, gone back into go, you know, doing a business thing. But he decided to stay in the Marines and take a commission as a first lieutenant and go fight in the Philippines. Um, he was okay. not immediately good at war. He was uh, initially tasked with garrison duty, which bored him so much that he just spent all of his time drunk. He was at one point relieved of command temporarily due to something he did in his bedroom, which is all that we know about the incident. He did, he, he, did, he, did, he did something with alcohol in his bedroom that made his superiors be like, this guy can't be in charge of people for a while. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Leave that man alone. Yeah, yeah fill, fill in the blanks, you know? Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Let that man live. Um, 
So in October of 1899, he saw his first combat action when he led 300 Marines to conquer a town from the people who, you know, lived there, right? Like, the, yeah. this is a colonial, a brutal colonial war. It's still we, colonial. Got like, it. Like, he's, he's, a, he's the bad guy, right? That we're, we're the bad guys in that war. Um, yeah, and Butler fell in love with battle uh, and with the Marine Corps. Uh, he just was very, and was very good at fighting. Like, he, it, this is a, a really mm-hmm. difficult, desperate uh, situation and he he uh, comports himself well. He's good at, at, at leading men in combat. Um, and he f- becomes after fighting so enthralled with the Marine Corps that he hires a tattoo artist to give him a full from his neck to his belly tattoo of the Marine Corps emblem. Ooh-wee. Like okay. <laughs> this, he's very into the Marines. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Loves Dang. him some being a Marine. <laughs> yeah. You getting a full day? Mm-hmm. That's that's some uh, that's mm-hmm. some that's some Ben Affleck. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I think yeah. There's I know people, including some Marine vets, who will argue that the the Marine Corps is kind of the cultiest of the of the military branches. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some might argue that's because they're the best at what they do. Um, but some Butler is definitely that. drinking the fucking Kool Aid, right? Drunk it, boy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So he gets sent to China next as part of the U.S. detachment sent over during the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, He's wounded in combat, and despite having a bullet, like one of his men gets hurt, and he runs out to get him and gets shot in the leg, and despite having a bullet in his leg, he drags multiple men to safety while actively under fire and bleeding. Um, And again, the Boxer Rebellion, another brutal colonial action, Um, but... He's he comports himself very well. Uh, now, at that time, commissioned officers were unable to receive the Medal of Honor. Otherwise, he probably would have earned one. But he received some decorations for his gallantry under fire. Smedley Butler would spend the next like couple of decades as he would grow into what was probably the best soldier in the American Empire. Like he is an mm. exceptional imperial soldier. Um, he fights in the Banana Wars, which were a series of police actions and intervention in the Caribbean and in Central America made on behalf of U.S. business interests, killing yeah. people for he's 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 killing people for banana companies. He's killing people for United yeah, yeah, Fruit, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, he fights in Honduras where he was constantly near death with fever uh, and received the nickname Old Gimlet Eye because the, his <laughs> eye his every like he, he was he looked terrifying. He was this gaunt, uh, scar filled monster with bloodshot eyes. Um, oh and like God. just feverish. Yeah, that's his that old gimlet eye is like he looks like a fucking uh, a wraith, you know? I uh, love this guy yeah, so far. He's, except for his except for his colonial colonial stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he's fighting on the wrong side, but he's objectively a badass. Um, so Butler yes. racks up promotion after promotion. He enforces U.S. foreign policy in Nicaragua. He's sent uh-huh. as a spy during the Mexican-American War. He's sent as a spy to Mexico City or one of the wars that we fought with Mexico, he sent us a spy to Mexico City to help the United States gather information for the siege of Veracruz, which a lot of people don't know we were doing in the early 1900s. We, like, bombed Veracruz. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a good Warren Zevon song about it. Butler was one of nearly 60 American servicemen who received medals of honor for their service in Mexico because he fights in, in Veracruz as well. Uh, and virtually all of those medals were complete bullshit. Like they hand out 60 medals of, of honor for the siege of Veracruz and they're doing mm-hmm. it because Woodrow Wilson, the president, knows that like this is an ugly colonial war and he wants to dress it up by making it look like by putting out a bunch of stories of heroism and stuff. So he hands out the military's highest honor like candy. And there's actually a bunch of, it's a big controversy at the time because a lot of veterans are like, you're devaluing the Medal of Honor by using it this way. Um, And Smedley Butler receives one of these show Medals of Honor. And he tries to return it, arguing that he'd done nothing to deserve it and he shouldn't get it. Uh, But he's ordered by his superiors to keep the medal and wear it on his uniform. Um, So you're seeing he's he's starting to like realize like, that's kind of messed up. Why? Why? why yeah. Like, I, I don't deserve this. Don't give this to me. Yeah. Um, I like that. Yeah. See, he's, he keeps me. He keeps me like imbalanced. Here. Yeah. 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 You're gonna. He, he's. He's. He's a growth story. Smedley. Smedley's yeah. always changing. Um, yeah. Especially knowing because of the behind the police stuff. Like, I know where this guy lands. Mm-hmm. Where I'm just like, I. Sh- why am I feeling any yeah. sympathy about you? Yeah. Yeah. It's. It's. Uh, that's. That's not even quite. Yeah. We'll. We'll talk about it. So in oh. Haiti. In Haiti, Butler wins his second Medal of Honor. Um, and this was one for actual fighting. His unit was sent into the country when the president was murdered by a mob. Uh, Butler and his troops were repeatedly outnumbered by insurgents and over a long campaign succeeded in breaking the insurgency and establishing order for the U.S. backed dictatorship. Butler himself helped organize the Haitian police. And in his own recollection, he and his men hunted enemy rebels, quote, like pigs. 
Um, so again, this he is a brutal soldier of empire, like building the police force for a dictator. Um, you know, you, you have to <laughs> kind of look at <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not great. Um, it's, yeah, it's not great. Now, Smedley was promoted to brigadier general at age 37. Uh, he was and remains one of the most highly decorated soldiers in the entire history of the United States military. He's got two medals of honor. Um, and he's he's like, you know, as a general rule, generals don't get medals of honor. Certainly not two of them. Um, they don't tend to be fighting guys, but Smedley is a fighting guy. He's not a stand back and give orders. He's a get stuck in kind of dude. Um, he desperately wanted to fight in France during World War I, but he was not assigned combat duty. This is probably because by the later stage of his career, he was seen as politically unreliable due to the tendency he developed over the years to say exactly what he felt. Uh, Butler retired in late 1931. He ran for Senate in 1932, supporting Prohibition, but he was defeated. And in the late stage of his career, while he's still in the Marines, is when he's running the police in Philadelphia during that brief tenure. Um, so this is, you know, our story starts after he's, he, you know, he, he took what he learned in Haiti and tried to apply it to the right. Philadelphia police. It didn't work out great, but he's kind of the father, in a lot of ways, one of the fathers of militarizing the U.S. police. Okay. Um, and now he's he's retired. He tries to get into politics. Yeah. He's not good at it. Um, and by the early 1930s, Smedley Butler, who is, is probably the greatest soldier in any empire ever had, um, had started to change his mind on some things. A lot of this had to do with the Great Depression and a social movement that it spawned called the Bonus Army. The gist of it is that when the economy crashed, a bunch of World War I veterans found themselves unemployed, in a lot of cases, homeless and starving. These guys okay. had been given what were called service certificates in 1924, which was the government saying, we will pay you a bunch of money for what you did in the war, but not yet, because these were bonds. So they couldn't redeem them until 1945, right? Oh, and the idea was it. like- Imaginary money. Yeah, imaginary money that like yeah. in 30 years, this will be enough money to maybe retire on, but like not now, but yeah. there's, we're yeah. starving now, you know, like I can't yes, wait another 15 now. years. Cool. Um, so obviously, yeah, in 1924, this would seem like a good deal, but after two years of economic collapse, a lot of people just couldn't wait anymore. Uh, and in June of 1932, more than 40,000 veterans protested in Washington, D.C. Uh, they called themselves the Bonus Expeditionary Force, or the Bonus Army, and they advocated for Congress to pass an immediate soldier's bonus for serving in World War I. Now, again, we're all living through our own version of, of something similar. So you know what comes yeah. next. Congress adjourned without actually doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. This pisses the bonus army off and they started getting loud and unruly. So the cop shot two of them, uh, which eventually provoked a riot. The whole mass of men set up this enormous camp in order to hold up and wait for Congress to do something right. They, they like build a camp and they're like, we're not leaving until you give us some fucking money. Um, the bill makes its way into Congress, but it gets defeated. Congress, based on some powerful financial interests, decides it's too expensive to pay these veterans. Um, so they lose. They don't get their bonus, but the camp doesn't disperse. Um, and when the camp doesn't disperse, the Hoover administration announces that it's sending in the army to evict the soldiers. Now, it was at this point that General Smedley Butler visited the camp. Um, he told the soldiers that he thought they were well within their rights to lobby Congress. Corporations can. Why can't why can't people like us, you know? Um, mm -hmm. he spent the night there with the men. Uh, he had breakfast with them. He told them they were good soldiers and he was proud of them. Um, and a week or so later he leaves and a week or so later, America's most overrated general, Douglas MacArthur disperses the crowd with a mix of men on horseback and poison gas. Um, oh, and this radicalizes Butler. Um, initially yeah. he just becomes very anti Herbert Hoover and, and, you know, advocates for Hoover to get his ass kicked in the election that year. And Hoover does lose reelection that year. It turned out to yeah, maybe does. be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Can't turn on the people, bro. No, no. And he's a yeah. shit president in general. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wins, wins the election that year. He becomes the president. He promises Americans a new deal which wealthy mm -hmm. capitalists saw as a clear sign that Roosevelt was about to open the door to Soviet communism and take all of their money. God damn um, it, man. <laughs> just, yeah. Why are y'all so scared all the time, man? We're going to talk about that. There's an interesting okay. story there. Um, so one yeah. of the men who gets scared by the New Deal is a guy named Robert Sterling Clark, and he's the heir to the Singer sewing machine f fortune. Um, everybody's seen a Singer sewing machine. That's the yeah. kind of money this guy has, you know? That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. And we're talking singer sewing machines in the 30s when everybody uses them all the time. Yeah, we too, actually, right? yeah, every house had it. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not a hobby. It's the only way you have pants. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Another guy who got scared was a Wall Street financier named Grayson M.P. Murphy. And another was Prescott Bush, the father of President George H.W. Bush. And who was what? it? That, yeah, yeah. He, he really doesn't like the New Deal. Um, and it, uh. Prescott Bush is an investment banker uh, on Wall Street at the time. Um, OK, yeah. So these three are the best known members of what came to be called the business plot. And we'll talk about them all a bit more. Uh, but before we get into their plan to overthrow the United States government and institute a fascist state, I should probably make it clear that a lot of rich Americans in the 1930s wanted to at least see FDR thrown out on his ass for suggesting that yeah. rich people be taxed to stop poor people from dying in the street. Again, not surprising to anyone living no, no, through no, no, 2021. It's not, <laughs> it's not I mean, yeah, it wasn't new then. Yeah, so, not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to read, a, I found a very good summary of, of kind of this situation in a, the American culture at the time from a college thesis by Bradley Galka of the University of Albany that I really recommend reading. He does a great job of, of putting this all together. Quote, Mm -hmm. William Manchester, in his book, The Glory and the Dream, describes the fear which upper class Americans had of a lower class revolt in the months before Roosevelt's inauguration. Among the propertied classes, he writes, the distinction between the poor wanting bread and a full on communist revolutionary was often non-existent. The rich would have to take their security into their own hands. If the government could not keep order, each man must look to his own. Businessmen in a number of cities formed committees to cope with nameless terrors should railroad and telephone lines be cut and surrounding highways blocked. Candles and canned goods were stockpiled. A Hollywood director carried with him a wardrobe of old clothes so that he could disappear into the crowd on a moment's notice. In New York, hotels discovered that wealthy guests who usually leased suites for the winter were holing up in their country homes. Some had mounted machine guns on their roofs. Manchester goes on to say that the paranoid elites were not really so paranoid. The evidence strongly suggests, he writes, that had Roosevelt in fact been another Hoover, the United States would have followed seven Latin American countries whose governments had been overthrown by depression victims. So there is revolution in the air, and it scares oh the God. fuck out of these people. They're bolting machine yeah. guns to their country houses, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so the fears of this particular group of rich white dudes were further confirmed by the fact that left-wing writers and intellectuals were louder than ever in their anticipation of a coming communist revolution. Things were, from the outside at least, looking pretty good in Soviet Russia compared to at least the reality that a lot of Americans knew. In 1932, the socialist presidential candidate, uh, we used to have socialist presidential candidates, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, tripled his share of the vote from the 1928 election. Um, and uh, yeah, so socialism is actually doing, starting to do pretty well in American politics. Socialism was mainstream in a way that seems impossible now. One example of how mainstream it was, Governor Floyd Olson of Minnesota announced that he would not take any recruit for the National Guard who, quote, doesn't carry a red card because he said, what? Minnesota is a left-wing state. Like, I'm Minnesota. only putting communists in the army. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Minnesota. governor of Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> what world is this? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, obviously, if you've got a left-wing governor of an entire state saying Minnesota is socialist and we're raising an army, a lot of capitalists are going to get freaked out. Whoa, um, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> the right-wing governor of Kansas, Alf Landon, declared that, quote, the iron hand of a national dictator is in preference to a paralytic stroke. So the right is saying we need a dictator and the left is saying we need an army. Um, you might recognize this as kind of identical in rhetoric to both what you were see hearing in Portugal and Spain before those countries had coups, right? Portugal was saying yeah. we need like an iron chancellor. Yeah, yeah he's saying man. we need the iron hand of a dictator, you know? Yeah. Same rhetoric. Uh, Republicans were surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, willing to endorse outright fascism over socialism. Senator David Reed of Pennsylvania, a Republican, stated, if this country ever needed a Mussolini, it needs one now. Wait, wait, wait. You let that come out your mouth? <laughs> yeah. He let that come out his mouth. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you are not, you are not thinking, you're not thinking long game, big mm -hmm. homie. Okay. Wow. No, long game. Things turn out kind of upside down for Mussolini. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> so in saying this, Senator Reid was tapping into what was at that point more or less an American meme, a surprising love of Mussolini. P Benito Mussolini was huge in America in this period. This is like the 20s and 30s. He, the people love his ass. I did not know that. Yeah. He's so it's, I did not know because I spent so, you know, obviously during this time, I'm 
I'm in Harlem. Yeah. Like, my whole history is what's happening with black people right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I never even thought about my lord, like there was Mussolini stand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what's happening with white people at the time. That's <laughs> they're, crazy. They're like, being, getting real into we're Mussolini. Jazz. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We over here inventing jazz. You yeah. talking about Mussolini kind of fly. <laughs> like, dang, man. Look at that guy. Look at the way he wears boots. <laughs> <laughs> So historian Uh, John P. Diggins argues that a large number of American journalists in the 20s and 30s supported Italy's fascist regime from the March on Rome out up to the outbreak of Italy's invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. That's kind of what like stops the Mussolini uh, 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 honeymoon period when he gasses a bunch of people to death. Yeah. Um, But up until that point, he's really big. Uh, Diggins writes that a large number of American journalists, quote, succumbed to fascist propaganda and a few actually prostituted themselves in the pay of the Italian government. So Mussolini spends a lot of money um, trying to push articles and think pieces that would give fascism a positive reputation in the United States. He's bribing reporters and editors Uh um, to write articles that make fascism seem good. Now, historian Gian Mignone uh, notes that he Mussolini spent particular effort influencing, quote, the financiers who needed to be able to count on favorable future conditions for their European investments. Mussolini's favorite target and his best friends in the United States were J.P. Morgan and his family. Duh, oh, my God. <laughs> there they are. There you go, dropping these names. Yeah. These out of nowhere names. We're like, wait, that guy, like, the story just turned so weird. That's yeah. J.P. Morgan. That's so weird that J.P. Is. Morgan loved fascism. <laughs> Turns out. <laughs> Wild. This is when I wish I had one of those buttons so I could do the... Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, another big Mussolini fan and his primary propaganda distributor was the press syndicate run by William Randolph Hearst. Um, Also, big fan of fascism, Willie Hearst. (laughs) So we'll talk a little bit more about Hearst in a bit, but I want to note that there were also some very good reporters at the time who saw what was happening, what Mussolini was doing, and who spoke out against it lucidly and properly. The Chicago Tribune's George Selds was probably one of the best journalists for this. He wrote, quote, Far away, fascism has been attacked, exposed, and denounced by the same publications which for years ran articles lauding Mussolini and his notable backers in all lands. And the Hearst newspapers, which published from 1934 to Pearl Harbor, dozens of signed propaganda articles by Dr. Goebbels, Goering, and other Nazis, now call them names. But no publication which takes money from certain big business elements will dare name the native or nearby fascists. In many instances, the publications themselves are part of our own fascism. And that so hmm. Selds is kind of recognizing and, and was one of the few guys to be like really try to drum home, drive home openly. And this he wrote this obviously after World War II started that like, oh, yeah, as soon as we're at war, y'all are against Mussolini and Hitler. But you let them publish fucking articles before you b- yeah. before this shit happened. Yeah. Like, come on, and, bro. And you ignore. Yeah. Selds argued that fascism, American fascism, was not just limited to lunatic fringes of society, but was influential in major economic, social, and political circles. He asserted that there were communists in the United States who, quote, organized big business in a movement against labor, signed a pact with Nazi agents for political and economic penetration of the U.S., founded a million-dollar-a-year propaganda outfit to corrupt the press, radio, schools, and churches, and delayed the winning of the war through the acts of dollar-a-year men looking out for present profits and future monopoly rather than for the quick defeat of fascism. And there's a lot of these guys. And it's like so in ter- when you're looking at American corporations who directly with their money supported fascism and funded fascist propaganda, you're talking General Motors. You're talking the DuPont Corporation. Dang. And you're talking Reader's Digest, <laughs> who Reader's were Jesus. way into fascism. God, dog, yeah. man. It's like, yeah, there's no ending, bro. Mm. <sighs> there's just no... Wow. We don't talk about the time Reader's Digest was whole hog for Mussolini. <laughs> yeah. Like, again, yeah. that's number three, mm-hmm. the name you never thought you'd get. When the last time you said the word, well, you, because you did, when the last time any of y'all said the word Reader's Digest? <laughs> I've been published in them and I don't think about them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Robert. What? That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. know who won't fund a fascist propaganda campaign to convince financiers that Benito Mussolini has the right idea. Oh, pick me, pick me, pick me. I know the answer. I know the answer. I know the answer. Uh, who, who, who is it? Who won't do that, Sophie? The fine products and services that sponsor this podcast. Nailed it. Nailed Yay. it.
We're back, and God Almighty, I know that J.P. Morgan bet the bank does adver- throw in random ads sometimes, and I I kind of hope one came in in between as we're that talking would be about incredible. Uh, it's very funny. Um, very funny. So. Uh, This is all, all of this stuff that we're talking about is what's cooking off in the background when a fuckload of rich guys, and we don't know all of the folks involved or who they were. We'll talk about why near the end of this. But um, uh, obviously, some of them are J.P. Morgan. Like, (laughs) yeah. Um, William Randolph Hearst is is almost certainly a part of it. There's a good chance Henry Ford was, but we don't know exactly who was involved. We know some of the people, though, including George H.W. Bush's dad. So at any rate, this cabal of financiers and rich guys pick a couple of patsies to do the grunt work because they decide, okay, you know, the very wealthiest men are like, okay, we need to find a way to take power and we need to do it stealthily because Americans won't stand for an open fascist coup. Um, Hmm. So we're going to need, they, they pick a couple of guys to kind of do the grunt work of actually organizing this fascist coup. And the dudes okay. they pick are uh, are Gerald C. McGuire and Bob Doyle, um, and they're these guys are bond salesmen, right? They're stock traders essentially. All right, um, and they're both veterans. Imaginary money again. Yeah, they're imaginary money guys, uh, and yeah. they're both members of the American Legion, which had been established uh, to support veterans' rights and activities. And they're both vets, you know, um, yeah. which is not a you know a lot of people are vets. World War One's just ended. So these guys, like th- these rich dudes, some of whom were had also been veterans, um, had watched what had happened with the Bonus Army in D.C. They'd seen tens of thousands of veterans march on Washington. Um, and obviously, they hadn't supported those guys getting any money because it would have meant taxing rich people. But they thought there was potential in having tens of thousands of combat-hardened men march on the Capitol. And they basically started saying to themselves, what if we could harness that kind of force and put it under the control of a guy that we control and they trust? Maybe we could overthrow the government. <laughs> Whoa. And Americans wouldn't be it because they'd say, oh, these are our vets. You know, they're, they're coming yeah. in to fix things, you know? Yeah. Well, they're, they're, you know, we support our troops. Yeah, exactly. It's a good yeah. idea, you know? Yeah. You're going to overthrow. So obviously... They're looking at who can we who can we put in control of tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of veterans who will be easy for us to control, but also who everyone respects and loves and who no one's going to accuse of any ulterior motives. Oh, my God. Who is it? Well, it's the perfect soldier of empire, the greatest imperial warrior who ever existed. Retired General Smedley Butler. Uh, they're like this is the guy who can do it and he and, yeah. and they, they look look at all of these all of these wars that we profited from that we yes. got america into to make money he fought in and ran things like he we, he's already done this for us he's perfect you know damn yeah so i'm gonna quote a write-up by arcadia damn. publishing for what happens next yeah okay. <laughs> yeah they, so yeah they're like he's the, he's the obviously he's who you go with Quote, during their first meeting with Butler, McGuire and Doyle asked the major general to speak at a Legion convention in Chicago, claiming they wanted to point out the various problems with the Legion's leadership. Butler was at first open to this idea, knowing that the Legion had several administrative issues that ultimately compromised veteran benefits. So they're like, hey, the Legion's having a voting convention to like vote on its its leaders. You know, we are also vets and like we, you know, obviously you're you're the guy we respect the most. Would you give a speech about some of the problems our organization is having? And he's like, sure. You know, seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, yeah. He's always going to try to help out soldiers when he can. Um But then he, as he kind of looks through the speech that they've written, he realizes that it says almost nothing about the American Legion leadership and is instead entirely about the gold standard and about how the the government needs to go back to the gold standard. Oh, dog. (laughs) Yo, I had to clap for that because I'm like, that is a juke. That is a really good juke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a zag. And Smedley's like, Wait a second. <laughs> Wait, I thought you wanted me to help get the American Legion working better. Why the fuck do I care about the gold standard? What the hell <laughs> I care about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they were like, basically, the, the what was that, the actual case here is that all of these bankers were scared that they had gold back loans from the government that weren't going to be paid back in full by the president. Um and, you know, they, they also kind of wanted to get Butler used to working for them as their agent and see if they mm. could, like, use him further. It's a couple of things going on here. Yo, now, that is textbook mm-hmm. rich guy, man. Very textbook rich guy. Like, just right on the nose. And what they don't yeah. realize about Butler is that he's not the perfect imperial soldier anymore. By this point, he's he's become a socialist. Um, 
And he doesn't bite. Uh, he actually yeah. thought Maguire might be mentally ill uh, because what the guy was suggesting seems so strange to him. And Butler's impression of Maguire didn't change over the next few months because the stockbroker keeps approaching the old general with new requests to address the American Legion for really incoherent reads. What seems to Butler incoherent reasons. Um, okay. And so in August of 1933, Butler and Maguire meet again. And by this point, Butler had started to realize that Maguire was working for someone. He starts to piece together. There's a through line for all these weird things he's asking me to do. There's got to be someone pulling the strings yeah. behind this. Um, now, because Maguire was the kind of guy who only valued money, he saw Butler's reticence and decided that like, oh, he's not suspicious because I'm asking him to do weird things. He wants to know that I have backing. So he basically flashes a huge pile of cash in Butler's face. Oh, so why? So rich guy only thinks yeah. <laughs> that everybody thinks like rich guys. Yeah. Got but it. Butler's like, it's re weird that you keep asking me to make all of these bizarre political addresses to the American Legion. And McGuire's like, hey, I got a hundred grand. <laughs> Great. <laughs> like, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. But what are you talking about, though? Yeah. yeah. And this actually makes Butler more suspicious because in his mind, no honest man has access to $100,000. <laughs> Keep it real. But like, I'm not supposed to like you, bro. But like, mm -hmm. dang, there's a great answer. It's like, what? what? Well, he's changed at this point. Butler's, he, well, has, he, okay. he goes through a very satisfying evolution. Okay. So McGuire admits that he has a backer. He, he says like, yeah, I, I work as a, a bond salesman for Grayson Murphy, who's a wealthy Wall Street financier who'd also been a colonel during World War One, but not like a real like he, his, his job had been coordinating with the Red Cross. He got a rich guy job in the army for the okay. war, you know? Um, yeah. So McGuire had paid one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars to underwrite the start of the American Legion because it starts after World War One. And he thought of it as, as, as an investment, right? Like Murphy's putting the American Legion together because he as a really rich guy is like, it's probably a good idea to have an organization of combat veterans who I can kind of direct. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. Th there's a plot going on here. Of course. So, yeah. Butler and McGuire start talking about McGuire's backers and McGuire admits to Butler that his boss, uh, Grayson, is one of nine rich men who were trying to pay for a national convention of the American Legion in D.C. Now, by this point, Smedley Butler knew something very crooked was going on. Uh, and Bradley yeah. Galka writes, quote, Butler did not commit to anything, but rather waited and listened to what McGuire had to say. The two met at the beginning of September. When asked if he had begun recruiting men to go to the National Convention, Butler said no. He told McGuire that he would not even consider cooperating unless he was allowed to meet with one of the principal backers of the plot. McGuire promised to set up a meeting as soon as was possible. True to his word, McGuire arranged for Butler to meet with one of the principals the following week. The man was actually an acquaintance of the general. His name was Robert Sterling Clark known to Butler as the Millionaire Lieutenant. This is the singer guy. Clark had been okay. a junior officer under Butler's command in China during the Boxer Rebellion. According to Butler, Clark had been a batty, sort of queer fellow who did all sorts of extravagant things. Called so, him a batty? Batty. Or like, like, as in like how we say that girl's a batty or like as in batty. As yeah, B-A-T-T-Y. Like, oh, like okay. this kid, this, he's this, you know, there he goes to war with this guy and everyone knows this kid is a millionaire and he's weird, right? Like he's oh, okay. a rich kid, you know? He's a I weird, enjoyed rich that kid clarification. That yeah, yeah, I was like, wait, what do you mean by a batty? No, no, like, no. And I was like, wait, you calling him a batty and then saying, well, he does queer stuff. I'm like, you just called him a batty. Like, yeah. bro, like just, okay, now I get uh, it. Yeah. You know, so the man, yeah, let's yeah, clarify that. <laughs> so, so, the, so, 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 wait, so make sure I'm following along. So, at this point, Smedley's antennas are all like his spidey yeah, senses and tingling all over the place, like some not right, yeah, something you know what is saying? what, fucked. yeah. And then he's like, and I don't trust you, rich kids, like y'all ain't never seen no combat, you ain't yeah. got no blood on your hands, man. You are you stayed on the porch the whole time, you wasn't running with the wild dogs, so, mm -hmm. so help me understand. And then he goes and he meets one of these rich dudes. He's like, hey, I remember this kid. Yeah. Oh, it's, okay. it's this fucking kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And he's also, he's also, this is kind of the guy that Smedley, he's a very intelligent man. He thinks yeah. something is fishy and he's like, I want to go up the food chain. I want to follow the money up. Yeah. I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to talk to the guy giving you money, you know? Yeah. Um. So the general meets with uh, Clark, this millionaire uh, heir. Uh, and Clark's first question was whether or not Butler had read the speech that that Clark had helped write for him. And Butler was like, says, yes, but it looks as if it were a big business speech. There's something funny about that speech, Mr. Clark. 
Now, once yeah. it was clear uh, that Butler knew he was being used for some purpose, even though he wasn't sure what that purpose was, Clark drops the act. So Butler says that and Clark's like, OK, you know, something's going on. So I'm just going to tell you the truth. And he tells Butler this, quote, you understand just how we are fixed. I have got 30 million dollars. I do not want to lose it. I am willing to spend half of the 30 million to save the other half. If you go out and make this speech in Chicago, I am certain that they will adopt the resolution and that will be one step towards the return of gold to have the soldiers stand up for it. We can get the soldiers to go out in great bodies to stand up for it. And obviously gold isn't the end goal here, but that's how they want to no. like start things. So that's their starting it. Okay. Yeah. And and this guy admits like, look, I, I am trying to use you to keep my money and I'm willing to spend half of my money to keep the other half, you know? That's what's important to me is continuing to be a rich man. Yeah. Now, in his wow, later, that's a, uh, there's there's some sort of yeah. like a, a kind of a dark and twisted, but kind of good financial advice in that. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll spend half of this if it's going to make my other half double. Yeah. Yeah. Or and it's like and he I, said he's also saying, like, I'm a, I'm afraid that the decisions being made by this government will reduce my class i'll lose it right? all yeah yeah, yeah, yeah you know exactly what that's what i'm saying like this like dark like okay mm -hmm. this is this is why they wealthy it's mm -hmm. like well i'm not just sitting on this stuff yeah. and i'm not willing to burn it all but i'll spend on what's gonna protect the other half yeah and increase the other half yeah you know what i'm saying it's yeah. how rich guys think, you know? It's how rich guys think. That's and my point, yeah. This enrages Butler. When the, when he said, like, Butler is kind of barely yeah. able to keep himself from just, like, flipping out at this guy. Because Butler, yeah. he had been, obviously, an imperial soldier. But his entire career, his focus, the thing that kept him going, was the well-being of the soldiers under his command, right? He had risked yeah. his life repeatedly and been wounded to protect the men under his command. And this rich guy is saying, I want to use your fellow soldiers for my oh, own to yeah. keep my money. And Butler's like, fuck that. And fuck yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, you know, at this point, yeah, we done. Yeah. Yeah. Now, at this point, Smedley didn't quite realize that his entire career up to that point had been doing the same thing in other countries, right? Had been like risking the lives of his men to protect the money of rich people. and grow their He doesn't quite get that yet. Oh, yeah, but he sees that what he under, he understands what this guy is trying to do now, right? Yeah. Um. So he gets angry and he tells the millionaire how he feels. I took an oath to sustain democracy. And that is what I'm going to do, and nothing else. I am not going to get these soldiers marching around and stirred up over the gold standard. What the hell does a soldier know about the gold standard? Um. Damn. So McGuire it's different <laughs> when it's direct, man. Yeah. Like when you see it, like rather than like at a systemic or like a, you know, a, a indirect way, like you said, like ultimately, you know, you're at least in our most recent wars, you just went to protect somebody's money mm -hmm. and to hold up a crooked regime. You know what I'm saying? But if somebody couldn't, but if like, if your general stood up to you and just said, Hey homie, uh, this place got oil. So we need to kill these people to get it. Mm -hmm. Like you would be like, I'm not gonna do that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna do what are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? But like when it's in your face, the way it was with him, he's like, no, listen, here's the thing. I'm rich mm -hmm. and I might lose it. So I need you to go get my money. Yeah. <laughs> and what? Th yeah. this is, this is a bit of a spoiler. This ha it being this direct for him is what helps him realize what the rest of his career had been. Right. Dang. Like yeah. this really is crisis. Uh, we're yep. not quite there yet. So, oh, OK, McGuire, like Butler's like, I am not going to to do this thing for you. I'm not going to go fucking put my neck on the line for the gold standard. And McGuire's yeah. like, all right, all right. And he's like, can I use your phone? And while Butler <laughs> listens, McGuire gets on the phone uh, in Butler's oh, house so funny, or not McGuire. Uh, 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 Sterling gets on the phone in Butler's house and he calls McGuire, the guy who had was his gopher. Um, and tells him that Butler's not coming to the American Legion convention. And Sterling tells McGuire to use $45,000 that he'd given him to flood the convention hall with telegrams, urging a return to the gold standard. And that's exactly what happens at the convention. The telegrams flow in and the resolution is passed condemning like the move away from the gold standard. And, you know, Sterling kind of does this to show off to Butler. Like, OK, well, if you're not going to do this, let me show you what I can accomplish. I can just pay 45 grand to get fucking uh, flyers put up and like yeah. it, it, we'll flood them with propaganda and make it happen. And okay. Butler takes this as the lesson that it is right. That these are powerful mm -hmm. men. And this is like, they do have the ability to, to make this shit happen. Um, 
So for a little while, that's kind of all it is. It's this weird thing over the gold standard and Butler, it, 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 it feels off to him, but he doesn't think much more about it until the next year, uh, August of 1934, when Gerald Maguire comes up to his house again and he and Butler meet. And Maguire tells the general, quote, the time has come to get the soldiers together. And Maguire, who's a veteran himself, is referencing the bonus army. He's basically coming up and being like, hey, you know, the things are still hard for veterans. Why don't you and I work out something where we can like get a, another group of soldiers together and maybe march them on Washington? Um, and Butler's like willing to have this conversation, right? Yeah. He's not willing to do the gold standard thing, but like, oh, yeah, you're talking about getting people together because veterans need some money. Absolutely. That's my whole Speaking thing. Speaking my language care now. Yeah. 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 Okay. But then the conversation turns. McGuire tells Butler that he'd just gotten back from an overseas trip. And it, was on, it wasn't a vacation, but his wealthy backers were paying him to go scouting. And this is what McGuire says. Quote, I went abroad to study the part that the veteran plays in the various setups of the governments that they have abroad. I went to Italy for two or three months and studied the position that the veterans of Italy occupy in the fascist setup of government. And I discovered that they are the background of Mussolini. They keep them on the payrolls in various ways and keep them contented and happy. And they are his real backbone, the force on which he may depend in case of trouble to sustain him. But that setup would not suit us at all. The soldiers uh -huh. of America would not like that. I then went to Germany to see what Hitler was doing, and his whole strength lies in organizations of soldiers too, but that would not do. I looked into the Russian business. I found the use of soldiers over there would never appeal to our men. Then I went to France, and I found just exactly the sort of organization we are going to have. It is an organization of super soldiers. And what Whoa. he's talking about, you remember the, the cross of fire uh, that we talked about last episode in France, that French veterans yeah. organization, you got 500 officers, a thousand officers and NCOs, and they control the votes of 5 million men. And they're very, very far right. Right. And they have a, a, yeah. a role in the insurrection that happens over in France, which has just happened at this point. So th these rich guys watch what happens in France and almost succeeds and are like, oh, you know, that's, that's not a bad idea. Why don't we yeah. set up a veterans organization like that? Um, okay. Yeah, so that's what McGuire's like. We need to build the same thing that they have in France because if we can get 5 million votes or so, like a coalition of 5 million votes, we can win any election we want. We can get rid of, you know, Roosevelt or we can march them on the Capitol, you know, if yeah. we have half a million soldiers. So Butler said, all right, like I'm not I'm not against this idea. If you want to organize a bunch of veterans to 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 make political changes, act as a voting block, that makes sense to me. Because uh, I care about veterans issues. Um, but what do you want to use them for? Right. Why are you, why are we building this? Like, because he's still suspicious of this guy over the gold. Yeah, standard I still don't thing. know what you're doing. Yeah. And McGuire assures him like, no, they're going to support the president. That's what we want them to do is to kind of support the president and his efforts to, to fix the economy. And Butler points out when McGuire says this, Butler points out that like, well, in all these speeches you wanted me to give earlier, you would had me you wanted me to oppose all of FDR's policies. So why are you trying to make a veterans organization to support FDR now? And McGuire responds, don't you understand that the setup has got to be changed a bit? Now we have got him. We have got the president. He has got to have more money. There's not any more money to give him. 80% of the money now is in government bonds, and he cannot keep this racket up much longer. He has got to do something about it. He has either got to get more money out of us, or he has got to change the method of financing the government. And we are going to see to it that he does not change that method. He will not change it. They're worried about him like going into debt and devaluing the dollar and stuff. Yeah. Um, so Butler sees where he, this is going, and he asks McGuire straight up, the idea of this great group of soldiers, then, is to sort of frighten him, is it? McGuire, lying, said that, no, they don't want to scare FDR. They just want to support him. And then he introduces oh, a new God, idea. Bro. He tells Butler, you know, the president's overworked, and he's, he's an old man. He's not healthy. Wouldn't it be nice if we could give FDR an assistant president? We can use this big armed group of veterans to convince president? the president to create a new cabinet position, secretary of general affairs. And this person will do all of the actual work of the president. And he'll institute policies that my rich backers know we're going to fix things for the American people. Whoa. And FDR will still be president, but he'll just be ceremonial and will be controlling things. And this big armed group of veterans Damn. will make sure that everybody plays nice. Wow. Damn. <laughs> that right up under our noses, mm -hmm. bro. So McGuire tells Butler that this is all necessary because the president is sick. And even if it's mm. not true that he's unable to do the job anymore, the American <sighs> people will believe them if they say he's sick because, quote, we have got the newspapers. 
He's talking about the fact that William Randolph Hearst is one of the guys involved in this plot. Like, yeah. whatever whatever we need the American people to believe, they'll believe because we control the newspapers. So all we need to do yeah. is organize this body of men. Okay. So in suggesting this, McGuire's rich backers were looking to treat FDR kind of the same way Mussolini treated the King of Italy or Hitler treated Hindenburg in his last months. Of course, McGuire didn't point this out to Butler, but he asked, would you be interested in heading up this super organization of veterans that we're going to use to take power? So he's he's all on the table now. Like, we're going yeah. to take over the government. We're, we're going to do it in a way that's not obvious. We're going to use the newspapers to make sure people don't know that we've just stopped FDR from having any power. And we're uh-huh. it, things are going to be run by the rich. Um, and but so he's like, do you want to be the guy who who leads this army of veterans into the capital to demand these things? And Butler responds. I'm interested in it. I'm interested in this veterans organization, but I don't know about heading it. I am very greatly interested in it because, you know, my interest, my one hobby is maintaining a democracy. If you get these 500,000 soldiers advocating anything smelling of fascism, I'm going to get 500,000 more and lick the hell out of you and we'll have a real war right at home. (laughs) He's a direct man. Yeah. I love it. He's yeah. like, look, man, you know how many wars I fought? You think I'm scared of you? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah it's like, and, and this, like, if you do this and I think you're trying to create a fascist state, I'll raise an army and I'll win. Like, you yes, don't know shit I'm about this. I'm an actual war vet. Like, <laughs> yeah. I actually know the veterans. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this makes McGuire backpedal a little bit. He's realized okay. he's maybe like gone. He was maybe a little bit too open about what they were planning yeah, he, to do. And he insists like, no, we're not trying to overthrow. We just want to support the president. We're not trying to take power. We want to support him. And Butler says, well, if that's the case, you're going to need a lot of money. Right. This is not going to be a cheap thing to do. And McGuire's yeah. like, well, we've got three million dollars on hand. You know, yeah, money we, ain't a problem. bro. Money ain't a problem. We get access to three hundred million dollars if necessary. Yeah. And so Butler, again, is like, who in the fuck is putting up this money? (laughs) Honest men don't have $3 million to throw around. (laughs) And so he's like, where are you getting all of this money? And I know it's not just Clark um, or Sterling, the guy that I had met earlier. And McGuire says, you know how Clark told you he would spend half of his uh, fortune to save the other half? Well, there's a lot of other rich guys who feel the same way, right? Prescott Bush and J.P. Morgan and all these these other rich dudes feel the same way. So... Smedley Butler meant what he said. He was absolutely committed to American democracy, and he never actually considered helping. But he knew the danger of what he was hearing, and he wanted to be able to expose it. And to do that, he was going to need a corroborating witness. So his goal now to becomes, I need someone else credible to be witness to the whole plan so that we can go testify to Congress. Just in case. Dude, yeah. dude Smed, dog, this dude's antennas are mm-hmm. like, they are attuned because yeah. to be like you can't just be like f you and storm the room yeah because these people don't need you they'll find somebody else yep. you know what i'm saying and it's like the understanding that like just that power play when you in a room with people yeah. that wealthy they always feel like they in charge mm-hmm. but that but that power is given to them yeah but if you don't if you don't give a shit about their money you know what i'm saying then then the power don't matter. You know what I'm saying? Then, yeah. then you realize really what's happening here. It's like, oh, wait, y'all got all this money and you still need this meeting with me. Mm-hmm. So there's some, you know what I'm saying? So like, and he had his antennas enough to be like, I need to make sure because it's not like these people can't put me away. Yeah. I need somebody over here to watch all this happening because they wielding all this power. And I, I am, you know what I'm saying? Like right now I'm in their good graces. Yeah. Right now they still hungry for me. So let me make sure I'm playing this. Doc Smedley, his antennas are hard. I yeah. love it. Yeah, no, he's yeah. he's he's thinking. He's thinking. And I'm gonna yeah, quote from a, that write up by Arcadia Publishing again for what happens next. Having previously worked as the police captain of Philadelphia, Butler reached out to a Philadelphia record writer, Paul Comley French, who agreed to meet with McGuire as well. During this meeting, McGuire told French that he believed a fascist state was the only answer for America and that Smedley was the ideal leader because he could organize a million men overnight. So French, the very skilled journalist, comes in and kind of on the guise of like, yeah, you want the press on your side. Let's talk about what you're trying to do. And he's like, French is clearly a good interview and gets McGuire to admit like, yeah, I want to we want to make a fascist state. It's the only way forward for America. And Butler's the best guy to do it. So French takes detailed notes uh, after all of these meetings. He would later tell Congress, quote, 
During the course of the conversation, he continually discussed the need of a man on a white horse, as he called it, a dictator who would come galloping in on his white horse. Damn. He said that was the only way, either through the threat of armed force or the delegation of power and the use of a group of organized veterans to save the capitalistic system. Speaking of capitalistic systems. Speaking of capitalism, you know who won't incite a fascist revolution? I mean, hopefully. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. I have something to tell you at this ad break that just broke in the news, but I guess I'll tell you now. Jeff Jeff Bezos just stepped down as CEO of Amazon. What the fuck is happening? He's transitioning to an executive chair role. Something's about to go down. Yes, I have some theories. That's big. Take this break. Take this break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're off. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, what are your theories? Something's fucking happening. Yeah. So here's my theories. I think there was two things going on here. I think uh, one is he's like, I would like the money without the headache. So let me just let somebody else have a headache. I'm the, just going to take the money. It says, all but, says, this is from obviously the Washington Post because he owns it. Yeah. Uh, Bezos will step down from the role after founding the company more than 20 years ago, ushering a new era for the e-commerce merchant giant currently current amazon web services chief andy jassy will take on the mantle of ceo i don't like Uh, i don't like that word mantle first of all yeah yeah but i think the money from the like from the from the web support platform services is now outpacing the products i agree so they're like we need to move that way number one and number two i'm positive they're gonna break the company up they're going to yeah. break this shit up because it's going to be a monopoly. So. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I better get out now. They're going to break the shit up. I, I really hope theory. so. Um, it, yeah. It should be broken up. <laughs> it, it should. Be. It's too much of a, of yeah. a business. <laughs> you can't be the grocery store and the groceries. Yeah. I yeah. think he just wants to go off into the moon and just spend the rest of his say, life. I mean, you want to be... No, I, wanna, I want all the money without yeah. the headache. No mm-hmm. reasonable person would be worth a hundred billion plus dollars and want to keep doing a job. Why like, do you keep working? Yeah, go fill an island with I don't know. No more, no more something. rich like, white guys with islands. I be, be I veto cra- that. It's no what islands. they always do. Yes, but but no. at the same, yeah, it's like you don't yeah. make a hundred million dollars yeah. to keep working. It's no. like you'll he'll never spend this. You yeah. will never spend this money. It's like the only so billionaire who's ever made sense to me is one of the Google founders who like spent hundreds of millions of dollars making a house blimp. And it's like, yeah, that's rad. Like, yeah, you live, on a, you live on a fucking exactly. blimp. You know what yeah. I'm going to do? I'm going to live on a blimp. <laughs> like, I can never, you can't even give it away. There's yeah. not enough, there's not enough hours in the day. You don't, you're not going to live enough years to mm-hmm. spend this. Yeah, you couldn't. Yeah. Uh, all right. We're back. Ah, oh, what a great, what a great time. So, uh, we're talking about yeah. This guy Butler brings in this journalist French who gets who gets these guys to throw down some dirt, right, and admit yeah what they're actually looking to do. Yeah. Um. Now, in his write up on the business plot, Bradley Galka notes quote. McGuire also discussed this group's intended solution to the national employment crisis. He said they were inspired by Adolf Hitler's policies in Europe, that the solution would be the institution of labor camps and barracks Sheesh. in America to mobilize the unemployed. You, you, you said you said it out loud. You said, yeah. you, you're not supposed to say that out loud, bro. <laughs> this Hitler okay. guy has some good ideas. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, we could save. Mm-hmm. You hear me? Hear me out. Yeah. We could save capitalism. We could save cap. What if we put the poor in camps and make them work for us? <laughs> <laughs> They're not doing anything right. They're, They're not, not doing anything right. Shouldn't be voting. They've just got to vote to take our money. <laughs> put them in camps. <laughs> uh, such an initiative, McGuire insisted, would solve the problem overnight. He also revealed that the plotters would force all suspected radicals across the country to register their movements with the government. That way, said McGuire, the new regime could stop a lot of these communist agitators who were running around the country. McGuire ended by insisting that another economic crash was inevitable and would come when bonds reached 5% interest. When that time comes, he said, the soldiers must prepare to save the nation. Now, it's worth reiterating two important takeaways from McGuire's interactions with Butler and French. 
First, during McGuire's meeting with Butler at the Bellevue Hotel in Philadelphia, McGuire claimed that he and the plotters have got the newspapers. He told Butler that whatever cover story his boss has decided to put in the papers would be accepted by the dumb American people who would fall for it in a second. Damn it. Not wrong. Yeah, not wrong. Not wrong. And Bradley Galka's write-up of this is very good. It's And it's free, yeah. so I, I really recommend it for folks. Now, at this point, Butler decided he had enough information to go to Congress. On November 20th, 1934, he appeared before the Special Committee on Un-American Activities. Before the committee and its lawyers, General Butler laid out the details of the whole sordid scheme, providing Congress with French's corroboration and the detailed notes that he himself had taken of every conversation. He swore under oath that this was all true and that a cabal of bankers and industrial magnates were plotting to overthrow American democracy. So he goes to Congress and he puts it all out on the line. And the story hits the news media soon after. The New York Post, which at this time is a liberal newspaper, publishes the first report, which is written by French himself. It outlines the details of the plot accurately. The Post also publishes a second shorter piece, which provides the accused plotters with an opportunity to give their denials. Now, the Post coverage here was both responsible and vital, but McGuire had not been lying when he said that his secret backers controlled much of America's print media. A second wave of coverage bursts from conservative, Hearst-owned newspapers. These papers tended to provide only the barest details of the actual plot and spend most of their time publishing denials by the accused magnates. One popular columnist, Arthur Brisbane, who worked for the Hearst-owned San Francisco Examiner, suggested that somebody may have been deceiving General Butler. He portrayed the business plot as more or less a practical joke and wrote mockingly that those wicked and bad and outrageous Wall Street men were the ones who actually had the most to fear from a fascist dictatorship. Uh, Adam Ock. Yeah. A flim flam boy. (laughs) Yeah. Flim flam. Yeah. Oh, look at this dumb general. He just he just he he got took in by a practical joke. You know, listen, he doesn't understand, you know, dog. And and I, I man, I imagine even like how. You stand in front of Congress and like this, I, I, I don't know, like if you have this this like sinking feeling when you're trying to say something that you know is true and you're positive the people in front of you don't believe you mm-hmm. and you're like, ah, ah, damn, this ain't going, I'm stuck, ain't I? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I wonder if, I don't know why as he was talking, that was like the moment I pictured when he's like, he went to Congress to tell them they, like he's snitching, but it's like a good type of snitch to where I'm like, yeah. No, I'm trying to tell you the truth. This is what these people are doing. Yeah, I don't know. Because it's like, even coming out of his mouth, he was probably like, do I sound crazy? I might sound crazy, but I'm trying to tell you this is what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Adam Ox, a writer for the New York Times, uh, wrote an article about the business plot. And again, it's not just Hearst Papers. The New York Times gets in on this shit. He writes an article titled Credulity Unlimited, which also mocked Butler and painted him as a crank. What can we believe? Apparently anything, to judge by the number of people who lend a credulous ear to the story of General Butler's 500 fascists in Buckram marching on Washington to seize the government. Details are lacking to lend verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. The whole story sounds like a gigantic hoax. Yeah. 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 Listen, this guy's crazy. Yeah. Talk to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, this Listen, silly old man we're just, thinks that we're businessmen just, want to take over the country. We're just regular rich dudes. Yeah. We're just saying it's fine. <laughs> and there is one of the things that really does corroborate that the story is true is there is a massive and very organized media campaign to discredit Butler. And it's not yeah. just journalists. Will Rogers, the former cowboy actor who like half of L.A. is named after. Yeah. I was like, wait, wait, wait. Will <laughs> yeah, Rogers, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Will Rogers publishes an article in the New York Times. He gets to write a column for the Times. And this article both mocks uh, Smedley Butler and in the article, after making fun of Butler for being an idiot, Will Rogers volunteers to lead a fascist army in his stead. If Smedley Butler don't take that job of marching down Pennsylvania at the head of Wall Street's fighting brigade, I would like to get my application in. I got the gray horse. It won't be such a novelty as people think. Like, this is clearly bullshit. But if it's not, I'd lead a fascist army on behalf of Wall Street. (laughs) Man, you man, that's the you remember Katy Perry tried to buy his house out here. Oh yeah, Um, it's a nice house. It's a very nice house. Mm -hmm. Went on a field trip once. Anyway, yeah. New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia called the business plot a cocktail push, by which he means he thought Butler had heard the plans at a part as a joke at a party and run away with the idea. 
Um, that's a great you the more I hear their defense that's a great cover story it's a great cover story they, they were just joking <laughs> dude we're just drinking it's yeah. like this guy got into this party he don't really run with us he don't know how we don't know yeah. how he work we're just yeah. playing around yeah yeah it's, it's not it's story. not dumb right these aren't idiots yeah. now the yeah. committee uh, the congressional committee the House uh, Un-American Activities Committee continues their investigation though and they find additional evidence of the plot. Concerted digging revealed that a number of the men implicated in the plot had recently formed a conservative lobbying group called the American Liberty League. Its members included J.P. Morgan Jr., Irene DuPont, the CEO of General Motors, the CEO of General Foods, and other industrial leaders controlling roughly $40 billion in assets, which in modern terms is three quarters of a trillion dollars. Oh, my um, God. All wow. of the richest guys. And that, yeah, like it, these are the dudes behind it. Now, this digging also turns up the fact that Prescott Bush, who was heavily involved in the, with the Nazi government, right? He's working with them on the Hamburg America lines and stuff. Um, that Prescott Bush, under the proposed American fascist government, would have acted as a liaison between the American dictatorship and the Nazi government. So George W. Bush's grandpa volunteered for the job of liaising between a fascist American state and the Nazis. Was like, oh, I love the Nazis. I'd be perfect at this job. What? <laughs> yeah. Prescott what? Bush. <sighs> so, and then gave birth to presidents. Mm -hmm. Two of them. Well, his wife gave birth to presidents. Let me clear that up. Sorry, ladies. He didn't give birth to nobody. Yeah. Okay. He donated genetic <laughs> material that yes. led to two presidents, both of whom were yes. trash. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the committee, after its investigation, never releases an official report on the business plot, but they do give a report to Congress. And in it, they say that they, quote, That's had so trash. Oh, it's about yeah. to get trasher. OK, but, but yeah. before Great. it gets trash, the committee goes to Congress and they say everything we checked out that Butler said we were able to verify. They say that they, quote, had received evidence that certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist organization in this country. There is no question that these attempts were discussed, were planned, and might have been placed in execution when and if the financial backers deemed it expedient. The names of the individuals involved, they said, would have to be kept secret until they could be investigated and their complicity verified. So they're like, we, we, we looked this up and we found a lot of evidence that it was true, but we can't confirm anything a hundred percent yet. And we're not going to give the names of the individuals we found evidence about because we haven't finished the investigation. Right. Which yeah, sounds yeah, yeah. reasonable. That's how it's supposed to work. But they never finished the investigation. <laughs> oh, man. After saying, hey, well, yeah, this. Yeah. We've corroborated everything you said. Yeah. OK, cool. And we don't know why the investigation doesn't get finished. There are some theories and I'm going to quote The Washington Post for one of them. According to journalist John Buchanan, speaking to the BBC in 2007, this was probably because Roosevelt struck a deal with the backers of the plot. They could avoid treason charges and possible execution if they backed off their opposition to the New Deal. Sally Denton, an author who wrote a book about the business plot, thinks the press may have ignored the report at the urging of the government, which didn't want the public to know how precarious things might have been. So, hmm. the, so the government that like was threatened by this may not have wanted it to be super public knowledge, right? Just like the, I yeah, don't think yeah, it's yeah. a good idea for people to know how quickly they came, how close they came to overthrowing us. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. You shouldn't notice. Yeah, and, and FDR probably sits down with these rich guys and is like, look, we can hang you and it'll be ugly for everybody. Like, there will be consequences. It'll suck for me. Like, Dog, listen. Or you shut yeah. the fuck up and let me do the new deal, you know? I love it, man. The brand, listen, this is a bad, this is bad for everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody loses. Yeah. I'm going to cut your head off. Mm -hmm. But... Like, let's just, I love it. Good yeah. job, FDR. Yeah, I mean, it was probably, like, I don't know. I'm not going to say it was the right thing. I think it would have been better no. to prosecute these guys, but. Totally. He's in a rough position. But, he does what it seems yeah. like the best thing to do at the time. Now, based on her research, Sally Denton believes that had Smedley Butler gone along with the plot, it would have succeeded. Uh, and he yeah. might have been the only person capable of leading that fascist coup who also would have refused to do it. It is hard to overstate how lucky we are that he was the man they went to. Right. Wow. Like the one yeah. guy who had that kind of respect among veterans, who had that kind of uh, talent and that kind of experience and also doesn't give a fuck about money. Right. Like, yes, <laughs> with the perfect. Yes. The perfect combo. Yeah. Damn. Now, 
Because he could, if he even wanted it yeah. and and cared about money, yeah. he could even extort these dudes. Yeah, yeah, he could. You and know they, what I'm saying? They're promising, like, we'll take care of your family. Your kids are never yeah, going to have to worry like, about anything. Yeah, he'd be damn right you're going to take care of my family. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You take care of my neighbor's family. Mm-hmm. You finna take care of my children, they children. You finna take care of us until the 2020s. But he Jump. instead decides, the thing that I swore an oath for was to defend democracy. Amazing. And that's what I'm going to fucking do. Um, and for his part, the business plot seems to have been the final straw in Butler's radicalization. He realizes after having been these rich guys trying to use him as a pawn that that's all he'd been doing his entire career as a soldier. He'd been a pawn of the rich. Uh, in 1936, he votes for the socialist presidential candidate. Um, in 1935, he publishes a short book based on a series of speeches. He delivered, he starts traveling around the country, delivering speeches, a speech titled war is a racket. And I'm going to read you a summary Butler wrote of his own book that kind of explains where this goes. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few, at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. Damn. And he's there's a lot of good quotes when he from, say, from this dog, and from Butler a, in general. That mm-hmm. is good. When he say the losses are in lives, but the profits are in dollars. The, the, yeah. Good yeah. God. Yeah. Good God. That's a bar. And he is Damn. Because it's truly unsparing. Like another quote yeah. of his that I love. Our boys were sent off to die with beautiful ideals painted in front of them. No one told them that dollars and cents were the real reason they were marching off to kill and die. God dog, dude. Yeah. I have a homeboy, the musician. He's a friend, but he's an incredible rapper. His name's Bamboo. Yeah, uh, from Filipino dude up up up. Well, he's from LA. He lives in the Bay. His wife, Rocky Rivera, both amazing artists. Uh, their whole label, Beat Rock, they're all these like left wing guerrilla warfare, like super revolutionary dudes. But he was he was an LA dude, got in trouble with the law, and then you know, like any other brown kid, you go to the military to try to like you know get out of jail. And kind of the same scenario. He came out of that so radicalized, so ready to be like. Yeah, this is all bull and I will never send another child. You know what I'm saying? He's not at all a pacifist. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Like the brother got a collection of like ancient island weapons, let alone yeah. guns. You know what I'm saying? So he ain't no pacifist, but he's like, I'm not dying for someone else's yeah. pockets. Yeah, it's like, yeah. dog. yeah, this is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and and Butler Butler is that like, Butler's not a fascist uh, or uh, not a not a pacifist, and he's not, not anti-military. He loves the military. Yeah. He hates what it's used for. And he yeah. when he's delivering these speeches, he's trying to get Americans on board with a complete reformation of the military. Um, he believes that it should only ever be defensive in nature, and in order to make it that, he thinks the Navy should be limited to operating within 200 miles of the coastline, and the Army restricted from ever leaving the confines of the continental United States. Um, Damn. Yeah. Uh, now that same That's year, interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. That, yeah. He's, he's trying to like. He, he's he, he thinks we need a military. It just we have to find a way to stop bankers from being able to use it to to fight wars for profit. That's the problem. Um, wow. In that same year, 1935, Butler gives an interview to Common Sense magazine where he tells the nation, "Quote." I spent 33 years and four months in active military service. And during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I remember that quote. Yeah, I remember that quote from the police (laughs) one. Yeah, he was just like, man, I'm just a goon. Yeah, I was just just a goon. goon. Yeah. Just muscle, just a goon. Mm -hmm. And man, this needs to be in, dog, I wish... There's a reason it's not in your history textbooks, yeah, you know? Like, this needs to be in every history book. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because, yeah, because the reality is we don't have, like, I was, as you were talking, I was like, do, is there any figure in America now that could do that 
And no. I'm like, I don't know. Only the imaginary one. Like, yeah. what was the movie? The American Sniper? Was that movie? Yeah, yeah. The, the, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That dude's imaginary. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, the, the, real guy, the, real, the real person that he was was like a lunatic. Like yeah. a dangerous like murderer. <laughs> and a liar. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he couldn't lead no yeah. fascist insurrection. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But like, if, if, if the guy that that was portrayed was a real person and maybe but we ain't got one in real life you know what i'm saying but the one that did exist came out of the other end going yo these wars were crap yeah and i was just out there getting y'all's bags mm-hmm. and this is ridiculous i was Damn. a fucking gangster i was you know a goddamn uh, and goon. he spent the rest of his life giving speeches and trying to radicalize veterans and mourning uh in public that he and his comrades had only ever fought for in his words the benefit of millionaires and billionaires he insisted Damn, that he had named names to the committee that he had that he had given the names of the people involved, but that those names had been removed from his testimony before it was made public. In a radio interview, he insisted, like most committees, it has slaughtered the little and allowed the big to escape. The big shots weren't even called to testify. Yeah. <sighs> if that ain't the streets, bro. It, it, it's very and it, it's not for nothing that he 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 names himself as a gangster. You know, he yes. recognizes like it's exactly why. Yeah, I'm saying the little the little corner boy doing 15 years mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying but nobody go to the you know what i'm saying the 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 russian oligarch that got him 15 bricks you know what i'm yeah. saying like he's living nice in the hollywood hills he, they don't mm-hmm. even he's not even in the testimony you know what i'm saying that's crazy and it's fucking one of the things that is because there's so much that's a bummer about this story right that they just get away with it but there is yeah. there's hope in it too and and the hope i think is in the story of smedley butler this guy who could not have been a more dedicated soldier of imperialism and yeah. realizes he was wrong and spends the rest of his life fighting against yeah, what he Yeah, you can't, you can't, yeah. you know, there's no time machine. You can't go back and yeah. undo what you did to freaking Haiti and Costa Rica and the yep. banana wars. You can't go back and redo yep. that, but... I can do the best, my best to pay it forward. That's yeah. good, man. Yeah, it's it is a it's a real story of of redemption, of redemption, and of a man who was had a. You got to respect the amount of self knowledge to be able to admit I spent thirty three fucking years as a gangster. Yeah, my friends died in a gang war over money. Yeah, you know, like over they, money. They, That's not even ours. Yeah, and we don't even get to collect. Yeah, Big Sean on the last record was like. Dude, y'all dying over street corners you don't even own. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's like, yeah, that like that, where you just like, we don't even own, we don't even own these projects. We don't own these property. <sighs> Dang, that's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, that's the business <laughs> so, plot. <laughs> so it happened here. It happened here. Uh, and yeah. the only reason it didn't happen all the way is that there happened to be one really good man in the middle of it. Dang, that is crazy. Yeah. So thanks, Smedley Butler. <laughs> right? We appreciate you. <laughs> One good dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and wow. I, I will say, I think that's maybe another one of the optimistic things to take out of it, is that it is a story of sometimes a single person with the right, w- who is willing to make a moral stand, can be the difference mm-hmm. between calamity um, and, and, and not calamity you know yeah wow anyway wow prop you got some pluggables to plug as we as we roll out of behind the insurrections this has been you can't say a pleasure can you (laughs) (laughs) but it it was i enjoy every time i get to like work with y'all and hear about the most horrible things in the world they're always just they're a great time of my day, although it takes me like an hour to recoup after we do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again for having me. Prophiphop.com. Uh, if this, as of the day that you're hearing this, um, which is Thursday, right? Is this yeah. the Thursday one? Yeah. I will be dropping new music the next day, Friday morning, new video, new music. So uh, please go to prophiphop.com. You can subscribe to the YouTube, get on Spotify. I have a ton of new music, um, a new coffee drop into. Uh, Hell yeah. So yeah, prophiphop.com. I got to get you a bean, man. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. I got to get you on Porigami Fridays too, man. Mm-hmm. Well, you're not on Instagram. 
Well, I, I, I do have an Instagram. I only follow one guy so far, and he's the guy who's okay. making knives for me. You have an Instagram? I feel betrayed. I wanted to look at knives. I mean, I forgive yeah. that part, but you should. But I could, I could add, I could have coffee and knives be my Instagram thing. What about Sophie yeah. and Anderson? I get, I, I talk to you on Signal. This is true. This is hurtful. I'm, but I feel you. I feel you. Either Rob way, we're gonna me. figure it out. Yes, I do. You're, mm-hmm. you're a fun follow. Wait, maybe you can log into the Bastards do. Pods Instagram. And oh, I've never there. posted or whatever it is you do on Instagram. Do you post? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you post. Yeah. I could add. Yeah. All right. Well, don't we'll find me on Instagram anyway. because I am not going <laughs> to tell anyone no my action there. You find me, Prop, on Instagram. No one else. I will find you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll be back next week for uh, something different. Um, it'll be fun uh, and a little bit of a break. And then we'll probably get back to talking about genocide pretty soon. Won't be long. Won't be long. Yeah. A genocide every month. That's the behind the bastards promise. That is our promise. (laughs) Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Deuces.